Welcome to Cardiology Fundamentals. My name is Wei Li Zhang. I'm a third year resident at the Osler Medical Training Program at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and I'm here to talk to you about approach to hypertensive crisis. Hypertensive crisis occurs in the presence of markedly elevated blood pressures, typically 180 over 120, and can be further divided into hypertensive urgency, which is asymptomatic, or hypertensive emergency, which denotes presence of end organ damage. As a result, when you are presented with a patient with markedly elevated blood pressures, your management will vary based on the presence and severity of end organ damage. When you're looking for signs and symptoms of hypertensive emergency, you should be looking at three organ systems, neuro, cardiovascular, and renal. Neurologically, hypertensive urgency can present with mild headaches, but hypertensive emergency can present with encephalopathy, retinopathy, or stroke. Encephalopathy and retinopathy will present with severe headache, vision changes, nausea vomiting as denoting increased intracranial pressure, altered mentation and lethargy, and seizures in order of increasing severity. When you do a fundoscopic exam, you'll be able to see papilledema and retinal hemorrhages as well as exudates. You'll also be able to see papilledema if you do an, if you do an ultrasound of the eye. When working this up, you'll be able to see white matter edema on CT head or, more sensitively, MRI brain. This white matter edema on the posterior cerebral hemispheres is what constitutes posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, or PRESS. Strokes can also occur. They are usually hemorrhagic and present with focal neurologic deficits, but also severe headache and nausea as a consequence of increased intracranial pressures. Hemorrhagic strokes can usually be seen on CT, but ischemic strokes will require an MRI. In the event of a suspected stroke, make sure to contact the rapid response team for strokes if your institution has one. Cardiovascular complications include signs and symptoms of acute decompensated heart failure, such as pulmonary edema. You have dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, and exam signs with elevated JVP or S3, S4 on exam. You may also see crackles, wheezes, or lower extremity edema. If the patient presents suddenly with sudden onset pulmonary edema, they may often have diaphoresis. In this case, you'll have flash pulmonary edema. The typical workup would be a pro-BMP, chest x-ray, and echo. If you get a troponin, it may be elevated. In the absence of chest pain or other anginal equivalents, you may have a type 2 myocardial infarction. You can also have an aortic dissection, which typically presents with sudden onset tearing chest pain radiating to the back. Usually, physical exam here is not sensitive, and you'll require an emergent CTA chest or a transesophageal echocardiogram in order to diagnose patients with a high pretest probability. With low probability, you can try ruling out with D-dimer. Lastly, hypertensive nephropathy is not always clinically apparent. It most commonly presents with microscopic hematuria on UA. However, if it's more severe, you can get an overt acute kidney injury with a creatinine bump, as well as clinical changes in urine character, or worse, oliguria. Hypertensive, hypertensive emergency can also cause microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, with schistocytes appearing on the blood smear, as well as a consumptive, uh, consumption of platelets, resulting in thrombocytopenia. In addition to end organ damage as a sequelae of hypertension in itself, you also want to be cognizant of other conditions that manifest with markedly elevated blood pressures, all of which require urgent management. The first two items, ischemic stroke and acute coronary syndrome, are by far the most prevalent. You should be looking out for them. The illness script for ischemic stroke, focal neurologic, neurologic deficits, are very similar with that of hemorrhagic strokes and require head imaging to fully, fully differentiate. Again, you should call your stroke response team to expedite your CT head or MRI brain. For troponin elevations, the symptom course, EKG, and echo findings will help you differentiate between acute coronary syndrome, or ACS, and a type 2 MI, anginal chest pain, dynamic EKG changes, and wall motion abnormalities on echocardiogram should steer you towards ACS. The next two conditions are much rarer. TMAs and pheochromocytomas. Thrombotic microangiopathies, or TMA, present early with headache fatigue, 
TTI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and increase in creatinine, and the classic decrease in platelets or thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia. Later, you get end signs of end organ damage with oliguria, lethargy, and seizures, as well as a fever reflective of systemic involvement. Geochromocytoma occurs classically as paroxysmal bouts of hypertension with headache, diaphoresis, and tachycardia, reflective of a paroxysmal catecholaminergic state. You can measure with urine metanephrines. The last two items, preeclampsia and scleroderma renal crisis, occur in a specific subset of patients. Preeclampsia will occur in, classically in the pregnant patient in the third trimester and can manifest with vision changes, headache, alternation, and shortness of breath prior to progressing to eclampsia, which includes seizures. Or liver failure. In patients with pre-existing scleroderma, pay attention to their renal function. You could be looking at scleroderma renal crisis, which requires prompt administration of an ACE inhibitor. Also, as scleroderma renal crisis often manifests in the first few years of diffuse scleroderma, your patient may or may not carry a prior diagnosis. So, for those patients, be aware of early manifestations, such as thickening of the fingers, fingers or pitting at the fingertip. After your clinical assessment, you're going to need to triage the patient. For hypertensive urgency, you can send them to the floor where they can get PO meds. If your patient is an ESRD patient with missed dialysis, they can also get dialysis sessions while they're on the floor, as long as they have no signs of respiratory decompensation. For hypertensive emergency, you'll need to make a decision between the IMC and the ICU. This depends on the degree of end organ damage and the underlying substrate of the patient. A mild troponin bump, or an AKI, might be IMC appropriate if there are no other subjective or objective signs of end organ damage. And there, PO meds can be titrated closely. Similarly, if a patient has a low to moderate suspicion for neurologic effects outside of headache, you can place them in the IMC for more frequent neurovascular monitoring. However, if a patient requires continuous drips, arterial line placement, they will likely require the ICU. Ditto for even more advanced support, including invasive ICP monitoring or mechanical cardiac support. Also, if there are severe complications, such as acute aortic dissection, refractory chest pain, respiratory distress, or profoundly altered mental status, your patient will likely require ICU care. If you've excluded end organ damage, you can proceed with treating hypertensive urgency. Now, urgency is a misnomer. You do not need to rush to decrease the blood pressure. It's more prudent to first verify your blood pressure with an appropriately sized cuff in more than one extremity. Next, you want to address underlying etiologies prior to administering any meds, such as volume removal for volume overload, support for toxidrome or withdrawal, especially alcohol with benzodiazepines, or pain control. If you choose to use it, uh, if you will choose to use hyper antihypertensive agents, you can use captopril, nifedipine, or oral hydralazine, but make sure not to decrease more than 25% of the MAP over the course of the first day. For hypertensive emergency, your time is more limited. First, establish your ABCs, adequate IV access, establishing mental status of the patient, and ensuring they do not need respiratory support. Call the relevant teams if your patient needs to be intubated or if you need to start BiPAP. Next, you will need a reliable method of blood pressure monitoring. Consider an arterial line. And then, your goal, blood, your goal blood pressure management should be decreasing the MAP 10 to 20% over the first hour and then another 10 to 15% through the rest of the day. Careful not to decrease the MAP more than 25% over the course of the first day. Exceptions include aortic dissection, for which you need to decrease the systolics below 120 and heart rate below 60 as soon as possible, as well as ischemic stroke, for which you allow permissive hypertension up to a systolic blood pressure of 220 or 185 if you are choosing to use TPA, and hemorrhagic stroke, for which you decrease the blood pressure to about 140, between 140 to 160. In pulmonary edema, you would decrease the blood pressure to a similar level until the patient is able to breathe more easily. In hypertensive emergency, you have a variety of agents at your disposal. The best agent will depend on the indication or the end organ affected. When you're using an IV drip, ideally you'll have an arterial line for precise titration and monitoring of blood pressure. 
but your institution may have specific rules regarding each agent, so consult accordingly. So this slide looks very busy, but we can split it up into three sections, of which we'll talk about the first four, which are the agents that are most widely used, nitroprusside, nicardipine, nitroglycerin, and labetalol. Nitroprusside is a direct vasodilator. It is a quick on, quick off agent. It is very potent and precise, and you can make titrations in about five minutes. However, with this, you'll require an A-line for continuous monitoring. It has a wide variety of uses. It's best for heart failure as it decreases after load, and it can be used with esmolol in aortic dissection for the most precise control of blood pressure and heart rate. Limitations include having to monitor thiocyanate levels, especially with doses more than 2 micrograms per kg per minute for over two days. Nitroprusside is also a direct vasodilator, but also because it has uh, more veno, veno dilation than arterial dilation, especially at lower doses, it is a less effective agent than nicardipine or nitroprusside. However, it is the agent of choice for flash pulmonary edema and is extremely ACS friendly, as it will decrease demand on the heart. Unfortunately, after 48 hours of use, nitroglycerin will often have a tachyphylaxis effect and will no longer be effective. Nicardipine is a calcium channel blocker, a vasodilator, and overall a great agent. It has a very benign safety profile, but the caveat is, due to its long duration of action, as you can see, one to four hours, you have a tendency to be able to overshoot your blood pressure goals. In addition, it is uh, contraindicated in severe AS, as well as HEPREF, this can cause hypotension in these instances. Labetalol is a beta blocker and alpha blocker, with about a 7 to 1 beta to alpha effect. As a result, it's less effective than the other three agents, but good in very specific circumstances. In intracerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage, it is first line along with nicardipine. It can be used in aortic dissection as a monotherapy, as it will be, uh, have an effect on both heart rate and blood pressure, and it is safe to use in pregnancy, which makes it first line. The next two agents, clavidipine and phenaldopam, are effectively comparable to the first four, but unfortunately are much more expensive. As of early 2020, they are not off patent. Clavidipine is a calcium channel blocker just like nicardipine, but has a far shorter di duration, as you can see here, less than 15 minutes. It's the only, uh, it, as a result, it allows for a quick on, quick off titration like that of nitroprusside, but with the safety profile of a calcium channel blocker. Right now, it's predominantly used in PACUs for post-surgical hypertension. Phenaldopam is a different agent. It is a dopamine ag agonist, and when you're using it as a drip, it's fairly easy to control. It's also the only agent on this list that will increase renal perfusion, which will further insulate the patient against AKI when you're treating for hypertensive emergency. The last three agents have more limited uses. Enalaprilat is an IV ACE inhibitor, the only one, and can be used in scleroderma renal crisis when you have no PO access for captopril. Otherwise, it has comparatively poor efficacy and less predictable hemodynamics. But, like labetalol, its bolus dosing sometimes allow you to use it on the floor, or IMC. Phentolamine is an alpha-1 antagonist and a very specific agent used in FEMA pheochromocytoma, and can also be used in other instances of catecholaminergic excess, namely amphetamine or cocaine overdose. Last but, and lastly, hydralazine is an arteriolar dilator. It is used second line in hypertensive emergency in pregnancy. However, it is notorious for its unpredictable pharmacokinetics. It can last anywhere from three to six hours, and you're never clear when you have three dose. Overall, it should not be used if other agents in the previous two categories are available and appropriate. In hypertensive emergency, You'll need to call cardiology if you need a transesophageal echocardiogram to evaluate for an aortic aneurysm or dissection, especially in patients who cannot take contrast, such as those in renal failure. In addition, if your patient is suspected to have acute coronary syndrome, consult cardiology for an angiogram. To review hypertensive crisis, remember the following. In every patient with markedly elevated blood pressure, evaluate for signs of end organ damage. Triage hypertensive urgency to the floor but emergencies should go to the IMC or ICU. If you need a trip or an arterial line, the patient needs ICU care. For hypertensive urgency, don't rush to treat. First, determine the cause of the elevation. And then, last but not least, 
aim for a 25% decrease in MAP over the first 24 hours, except in cases of aortic dissection, pulmonary edema, and stroke. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Shout out to Dan, Amit, Kareen, and Heather for this fantastic opportunity.